So uh, this is uh, Release Engineering and Rugged DevOps. Is there an intersection? So as Josh said, my name is Paul Reed. This uh, slide is mostly about my Twitter name, so you can tweet things at me. Um, as Josh mentioned, I do a lot of stuff in, in the DevOps community, uh, but my background is release engineering, so I'm actually really excited to be talking about release engineering because um, release in DevOps is kind of what release engineering has become, so we don't talk much about it. Um, um, these days, so I'm, I'm glad to actually be talking about it. Um, so the real question that, that you know, Josh and I were talking about is, is, is there an intersection between release engineering and rugged DevOps? And, and if there is, uh, what does that look like? And so I spent a lot of time thinking about, well, is, you know, can I give you a definitive answer? Do I, can I give you a satisfying answer? And, and, and the answer is, I don't know. Sorry, Josh, to disappoint a little bit. But, um, but as I was thinking about it, there do seem to be some similarities between this rugged DevOps movement and a lot of the things that release uh, engineers care about. So what are some of those similarities? Well, release engineers uh, and security people are really good at explaining what we do and why it's important. And as an example of this, I went around to some of my security friends and ask them, you know, well, so can you please explain to me in very simple terms, you know, what exactly is security operations or secu what does good security look like? Uh, and, and I got answers like this. To live and to live in a mystery and to find purpose and to live in the now magic Now. <laughs> so, uh, probably today, uh, when you've heard about DevOps, CAMS has come up, culture has come up, and I'm sure uh, a lot of you in the security community have asked that, like on the DevOps side, you know, you ask us, well, like, what specific things would we do to get that, that DevOps culture that everyone keeps talking about? Like, how can we incorporate that into our, our security, uh, the stuff that we're doing with security? And of course, the DevOps people love to give answers like this. Live in the moment. Don't get old. Don't judge people. Because you can't be free if you judge people love now create inspire so usually when you're talking to business people and you give those answers you kind of get this look so, so, okay, maybe, maybe our explanations need some work. Um, but it's interesting, right? Uh, maybe we're not so good at explaining what we do and the value that it provides, even though we intrinsically know that there's something to it. I think it's something that uh, security folks, at least the ones that, I, that I've talked to and friends that I have that work in that space, uh, seem to struggle with, and it's something release engineers, we struggle with all the time. So another similarity, uh, release engineering and security are often ignored in the value stream. We've probably talked a lot about value streams today. Um, Damon stole my thunder. He got to this slide before I could. Um, but you've probably seen this slide before. Uh, this was uh, from a talk Pete Cheslock gave. And I, I'll just point out, like, the reason this slide is so amusing, I think, because everybody's had this experience with, where it's like, it's up to his knees. Like, it's up to his knees and that, that look on his face where it's just like it is never going to end. And of course, the unicorn is like so happy. It's just like DevOps unicorn all day long. Um, and so a lot of times I think security feels like this. I know release engineering feels like this. Everyone assumes release engineering and security sort of just happen, right? Most people aren't selling release engineering. Most people aren't selling security. They're selling some product. And so they just assume, right, these non-functional requirements, it should be fast and stable, and obviously it should be secure. Um, you know, I, I've kind of felt like the, the donkey in this picture because it's like, let's load up that release with features and stuff. And I'm just like, okay, okay, that's fine. That's cool, right? And then the security people come along and they see like the release engineers there and they're like, oh, yeah, that's great. Uh, I'll see what I can do to help with that problem. What's more important about this slide is, is businesses often fund security and release engineering this way, right? In terms of time and, and money they'll pay for 
you know, employees to do this work. And so you get this kind of weird result. Uh, no one seems to care what we do until, until they do, and then they really, really, really care, right? So the business comes, there's some denial of service attack, and they come into the room and they just, just shut it off. And you're like, okay, that's not really how it works. We, 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 let's have a conversation, right? Um, this happens to release engineers all the time. Uh, I uh, worked um, on a browser. I shipped a browser for, I was a release engineer for a browser, the lead release engineer for a long time. And we made a code fix and we broke uh, MLB.com, MajorLeagueBaseball.com during the World Series. And suddenly they were like, how quickly can you ship this out? How quickly can you turn this around? So they care, they care about that stuff too. But they usually don't. So we have a, a bit of a negative reputation. Um, there's a few ways you could interpret this, but I'm specifically referring to, uh, and I saw it before, the Department of No, right? This idea that uh, we walk, I, I love the Phoenix Project, right? The person walking around with all the binders, the binders of No, right? Uh, release engineers often have the same thing where they're like, can we, can we integrate this new library? No. Can, can we uh, have a new build machine? No, you can't, right? And, and a lot of that's, I think, related to, again, how the business funds the, those roles. Um, but what's interesting for both of us is, is what I was pointing out in this tweet. This tweet is if we keep saying no, they're gonna find a way to stop asking. And I think we're starting to see actually some of the fallout. That's already happened, right? Um, we're starting to see some of the fallout, certainly on the release engineering side and definitely on the security side. Um, one of the other big things, uh, I think for both of us, uh, both of uh, our, our tribes, is there's a fundamental shift from doing the thing to building things that do the thing, right? So it used to be that you'd hire a release engineer and we'd sit at our keyboards and we'd type a bunch of things and then we'd ship the product and it'd be great, right? We don't do that anymore. In fact, it just doesn't scale, right? Individuals performing release critical tasks doesn't scale. So it's the same thing with security, I think. It used to be, well, you, you know, they would come in and do some audit at the end, or they would do some review at the end. And if we're doing this, you know, continuous delivery style, which we've heard a lot about today, you just, that doesn't scale. We don't, you, you, even if you could hire all the security people you wanted, you still couldn't do all the testing you would need to do if you did it manually with people looking at it. All right, so let's look at some of these, these similarities that we've got here. Uh, you know, we look a little off to the developers in the business sometimes. Um, we're shoveling DevOps unicorn poop. Um, maybe we're in project plans scoping, maybe not, it's not clear. Um, but when it breaks, whatever it is, people really care and they're all, all looking at us. Um, we have a reputation for no, uh, and the, the natures of our roles is going to, uh, undergoing this really tectonic shift. So this is kind of maybe scary, but the one kind of silver lining to this cloud is the industry is starting to get it. I think for both of our tribes, right? They're starting to see the impact of security or not even having sort of a security mindset, what that is for them, and it's, it's very bad, right? Similarly, uh, with a lot of what Justin was talking about, right, your, the release engineering capability, the people that are winning are the ones that can release fastest and safest, right? There's a security implication there too. So they're starting to get that the, the organizations that are winning are investing in this area. Okay, so how does release engineering impact or relate to or converge with security? Um, where do we see those intersections? Well, I actually came kind of into this space from one of Josh's talks on um, the software supply chain. And I, I really think, um, you know, this is one of a, a really big area and a big push for what release engineers have been saying for the longest time. It's very simple. Just tell us what libraries you're putting in the product, please. Right? You'd think this would be a simple problem, right? But for whatever reason, it's a very difficult problem. Um, and, and I've never really understood why, but I think the supply chain idea, this idea of, of relating it to manufacturing, there's something to that, and, and I'm really excited about it because I think it explains the metaphor well, especially with all of these DevOps Deming metaphors that we often hear. So I have a few rel and story, war stories about how critical this is, because um, you see it in ways you wouldn't expect. So 
I don't know if you remember this error. The uh, you know certain uh, sometimes you download applications from the internet and you'd run them on Windows and they would say, oh, I can't find the the C runtime DLL. And uh, you remember this error, right? And the application wouldn't start. And of course, what do people do when they get this error? They Google for the DLL, and then they download the DLL, and then they run the DLL. So. I had an engineering manager who ran into this problem on the build farm and subsequently installed the first DLL that he could find on every build machine. And we traced it back that it was a DLL being hosted in China, which was a lot of fun. And by the way, this is like a serious problem because uh, this was a major browser manufacturer where this happened. And then it became a chem spill because he put this DLL on all of the machines. So, so these are, are real problems. Now, one of the stories that Josh likes to tell that, that is one of my favorites. So I, I, I've heard of struts, but I don't really, I'm not a developer, right? I'm a release engineer, so I don't really know what struts is, except uh, I guess it's bad, right? Because <laughs> it's got a bunch of security vulnerabilities. <laughs> um, like, I, I don't know, right? Um, but he tells, Josh tells this story that I find very interesting where it, he was talking about a bank, I think it was, that had something like 60 versions of struts in one application, and 58 of them were vulnerable, right? Um, it's important to point out that one vulnerable library in your product is a security problem, but multiple versions of a vulnerable library in your product is a release engineering problem, right? So that's definitely a place where I think when we see that, and, and, and we've seen examples of this where people are downloading open source software like it's going out of style. And we see this still to all the time where there's multiple versions or, or um, different versions on different machines in production, that sort of thing. In fact, I think a lot of people, who's heard of Knight, the Knight Capital case? In, in security, it's a pretty big, show of hands, Knight Capital, yes. Okay, some people. So, the interesting uh, point about the Knight Capital case is uh, it was a case of a, a trading company, high frequency trading company, and something happened, and they lost something like uh, $300,000 a second for 45 minutes or something. I mean, they lost like $400 million like that, right? And it turns out, when you look at it, I think a lot of people in the security community thought, oh, they got hacked or something like that, right? And when they went back and they traced down what had happened, it turns out that they had eight high-frequency trading machines, and their software had a flag, right, that had been repurposed, and they installed the new version of the software on seven of them, and they flipped the flag on the eighth, and the flag had a different meaning on the older version of the software. And so it was like, let's make all those trades. Now, the interesting thing from a complexity, yeah, the interesting thing from a complexity perspective, and this is something that I think we really need to be aware of, you can go from everything's hunky-dory to 12 hours later, you've lost $400 million, to 36 hours later, you're out of business. And I think that's a great example. Um, it turns out they didn't go out of business entirely. They, got a cash infusion, and then they were acquired three months later. But so they don't exist anymore because, because of this. So we talked a lot about continuous delivery. Um, I think that's kind of, uh, I'm actually glad <laughs> that I've heard so much discussion about it, kind of continuous everything, because uh, I think this is something, again, where we intersect a lot. Um, we've got this you know, increased ability to ship quickly, so we can actually ship the, the product quicker, right? Um, that means we can react to security problems more quickly, which is great. Um, but we've also got this increased frequency, right? We may ship three or four times a day or once an hour or whatever. And so we've got this problem where we could have done all the security testing and we shipped it, and then we ship another version an hour later because we can, and that version maybe isn't secure. So it kind of puts us all on, on, uh, on alert, right, to pay attention to those things. Um, continuous delivery brings sometimes unwanted visibility. The one thing I haven't heard much discussion is I do a lot of consulting on continuous delivery and continuous delivery pipelines. And a lot of times people are kind of wonder why it's difficult to get continuous delivery to take root. And part of the reason is that it makes everything very visible. You, you really can't hide in a continuous delivery pipeline anymore. And that can be scary culturally, 
right? People have talked a lot about the tools, and that's kind of old hat, but the visibility that it brings, I think, is a little less understood, and it can be hard to get the organization to become comfortable with that, because sometimes how we make the sausage isn't that pretty. Um, but I think continuous delivery offers uh, the most promise for sustainably integrating not only the work that we do as release engineers, but the work that you do as security professionals. So a few other places that release engineering touches that might, you might find interesting or that I think that are relevant, especially from a security perspective, old-fashioned software delivery mechanisms. I'm talking about things where you still download ISOs for things and install them. Um, as of late 2015, if you go to Microsoft and download Office 365 for the Mac, you will be given an HTTP link to download that. If you say, well, you know, I'm on hotel Wi-Fi, uh, not that this happened to me, um, and you add the S, you will get a CDN certificate error. So there is no way to get software that you're going to run on your machine, right? And you think someone like Microsoft would get that that's like a bad idea, but I don't know. Like, buy a cert. Um, artifact management, big deal. Uh, you know, this whole idea, you can't really have a software supply chain if you're not managing your artifacts. Um, I can't tell you how many times I go into an organization and they've got Jenkins set up and they haven't really operationalized it. And so Jenkins has an algorithm when you run out of disk space, I'm going to clean the hard drive and then this product that they shipped, like all the, they go into it, like, oh, I think that build is three months ago. No, it's gone. Bye. Sorry. That thing you shipped out of the building is no longer there. Yeah. It's probably fine. Uh, the bold new world of containers. Uh, there's a lot of talk about containers. I think one of the biggest things that I've heard is, uh, and that I think about, is that containers claim, I think, to solve a lot of release engineering problems, or problems that release engineering also solves, and I'm not entirely convinced of that. Uh, I have a friend, Julian Dunn at Chef, who writes that containers are the new war file. Everybody just grabs them and unzips them and shoves whatever they want in there and zips them back up. Um, maybe. It's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, every versioning bike shed ever, that's another thing we deal with. And if you think versioning was a solved problem, versioning is not a solved problem. This was from uh, late 2015. It's probably fine, right? OK, so release engineering and rugged DevOps. How do they intersect? This is my uh, proposal to you. Let's find out, right? I think there's a lot of overlap between the work that we do. I think there's a lot of overlap in the roles that we play and the ways that we've historically been treated in the organization for better and for worse. So what I would challenge you all to do when you get done with the RSA conference and go back to your organizations, go find your release engineering team and talk to them. I guarantee you that the thing, having 80 versions of struts in the product keeps them awake at night too. They worry about stuff like that. So anyway, I would love to discuss this more with you. I will be at the evening event tonight. So uh, let's find out what rugged DevOps and release engineering have in common and move both of them forward. I think we can really leverage both of our talents and expertise and have it be a force multiplier for each other. So thanks.